Sean Douglas tried to leave the party on Toronto Street after hearing that he had been targeted for having money. Once outside, one of the accused, Joshua Wilson, ran after him, put a knife to his throat, and brought him back inside. From robbery with violence, extortion, and assault causing bodily harm, police do say several of those arrested are members of the Native Syndicate street gang. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the Native Syndicate, an indigenous-based crime gang that is still active today in Saskatchewan, Canada. We'll get into the details of how it was formed, what kind of crimes they committed, and more. Let's get into it. The Native Syndicate was formed by unaffiliated inmates in Canada's Western Provinces prison system in 1994. This was due to the rapid strengthening of both the Indian Posse and Manitoba Warrior Gangs, making the need for gang protection. And thus, Native Syndicate was born. It began as an Aboriginal prison gang that was entirely made up of hardened criminals in the Saskatchewan Penitentiary and Regina Correctional Centre. As more and more members were incarcerated, Aboriginal gangs became increasingly violent, so much so that the Correctional Services Canada reportedly transferred some Native Syndicate members to Manitoba and Alberta. But unfortunately for them, they began to set up chapters in those places as well. While the Native Syndicate may have started in prison, it certainly didn't stay limited to that for long. In the 1990s, members of the group started dealing drugs and were responsible for peddling cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, ecstasy, and a bunch of other drugs in the city of Regina, both inside and outside prison. They were often at odds with other gangs in the region, and gang-related shootings were extremely common. They were also involved in breaking and entering incidents, robberies, assaults, prostitution, vehicle thefts, and a whole lot more. Back then, they were considered to be untouchable in the city's notorious North Central neighborhood. They would wear their colors with immense pride and would even boast of police officers every chance they got. Being affiliated was seen as something to brag about and to be envied for by many. Many of the members were teenagers and people in their early 20s who were fascinated by the gang lifestyle and then before they knew it, they were stuck in, unable to leave. As things changed and law enforcement started tightening its grip around criminals in the 21st century, the Native Syndicate decided to adapt to the changing times. The brash, reckless, young criminals transformed into smart and calculated gangsters. They took a page from the organized crime playbook and decided to focus more on making profits compared to displaying their gang colors and symbols. They realized that like everything else, this was also a business, and advertising your affiliation can only damage you in the long run. It was recorded in the Winnipeg Police Department's gang unit database that the Native Syndicate had 143 active and 19 inactive members in 2000. This included generations of the same families, ranging in age from early teens to mid-50s. This started to move more quietly and delegated all the dirty work to new recruits. Recruiting seemed to be constantly going on. It doesn't matter how many members the police arrest, the gang is constantly getting more young people on their side. They find them in prisons, in the streets, through the drug trade, or even at parties. Although the gang became increasingly street smart, they were still considered violent criminals by the police. The police claimed that they were still brutal and ruthless, and were to be considered armed and extremely dangerous. However, as the law tightened around them, the gang had to take a step back because they were not as well established or influential as before. Not only were cops constantly arresting their members, but they also lost quite a few of their high-ranking members in shootings, and as a result, many rival gangs started gaining strength. For instance, one group called Native Syndicate Killers was set up solely to finish the hold of the Native Syndicate in the city of Regina. But despite all this, the Native Syndicate was still the most feared gang in the area. They continued their activities and made sure the money never stopped coming in. One such incident happened on the night of August 6, 2014. On that night, 54-year-old Sean Douglas went to the Triple Eight Pizza in Regina, but had no idea what was to come soon after. At Triple Eight Pizza, he ran into a woman he knew, who was sitting with her cousin. They had a few drinks and caught up on each other's lives. Around the same time, some members of the Native Syndicate had just stolen a car and also drove to Triple Eight Pizza around 2 a.m. One of them went inside the restaurant to buy a bottle of alcohol, and here he linked Douglas. Moments later, the gang member invited Douglas to a party, so he followed them to a house on Toronto Street. He didn't go empty-handed and brought some alcohol and food before going to the house. The woman he was with also came along to the party. However, she wanted to snort some cocaine, so around 3.20 a.m., he went to the ATM with her and one of the gangsters named Joshua Wilson. He withdrew money and gave it to the woman to buy coke. 
Soon after this, Douglas was beaten to a pulp, robbed of his wallet and debit card, and held hostage at the house. Wilson even forced him to provide the pin for his card by holding a knife to his throat. Then, Wilson and the woman withdrew $400 from Douglas's bank account and bought a bunch of stuff at 7-Eleven. The victim tried to escape, but they pursued him and brought him back inside the house. They then forced him into the trunk of a stolen Honda and took him to a rural area outside of Regina. One of the members gave the victim a cigarette and told him to start praying because he was going to die. Another one swung a sledgehammer that hit him on the head. Even though Douglas fell to the ground, they didn't stop. Wilson stabbed Douglas in the chest while one of his associates struck him with a pry bar. Unfortunately, the injuries were severe and Douglas passed away. The gangsters then drove back to the house but found that the police were waiting for them. They tried to get away but were eventually caught when the car they were fleeing in crashed. The three murderers were sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years after the jury found them guilty of first degree murder. However, the syndicate didn't stop there. The string of crimes continued and made headlines again in February 2016. One night in February 2016, 26-year-old Joshua Harden was out with his girlfriend and the pair were socializing and drinking at a friend's place. At some point, they disagreed on whether to go home or stay out. They separated momentarily but soon started looking for each other. Harden was walking on Garnett Street and he noticed a house party going on nearby. He thought maybe his girlfriend had got inside, so he went in to look for her. This turned out to be a fatal mistake. He was wearing a red shirt and hat, and unfortunately for him, those were the colors of Native Syndicate killers, one of the Native Syndicate's major rival gangs. And this harmless looking party was hosted by members of the Native Syndicate. As Harden stumbled to the door, several partygoers were alarmed by the colors he wore and immediately kicked him out. But the gang members did not let the poor man leave. The host of the party, Skylar Alexson, and several others followed him. Alexson approached Harden and delivered a single stab wound. The victim stumbled forward looking for help and soon collapsed in the middle of the street. His girlfriend finally spotted him, immediately called 911 and tried to make the bleeding stop until emergency crews arrived at the scene. However, despite everyone's best efforts, Harden was pronounced dead in the hospital. The victim was described by everyone as a loving and happy person, also a very good father to his 7 year old daughter. Alexson eventually pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to over 9 years in prison. However, not all members of the gang were hardened criminals. The native syndicate likes to recruit members when they're very young. We're not talking about people in their 20s here, we're talking early teens. Former member Cody Francis revealed that he was merely 13 years old when he first tried hard drugs, stole a car, and bought his own gun. For him, like many others, joining the gang wasn't really a choice. He grew up without a significant father figure and when his older brother joined the syndicate, he thought that was the right thing to do. He followed in his footsteps and believed that doing so would make him proud. Cody soon found out that his brother didn't approve of this and would always try to stop him from doing bad things. At first, he thought his brother was holding him back but he later realized that he was just trying to protect his younger sibling. This was something that dawned on him when he saw his younger sister going through the same process and becoming a member of the native syndicate. It broke his heart because he didn't want her to be a part of it at all. This is the case for several gang members. One sibling joins and the others follow suit. And those growing up without a family are even easier targets for the gang. Another one of their former members, Rob Hurley, revealed that he had informally joined the gang when he was 16 years old. He said that he and his associates felt invincible and cocky and strongly believed that they were always one step ahead of the police. He admitted that he joined the gang because it gave him a sense of belonging and eventually he started believing that they were his real family. He reflected on his days with the gang and said that he didn't have anyone to look up to apart from them. His father wasn't around when he was a kid so by joining he felt like that void was being filled. And of course, we can't forget about the profits. Rob claimed that they could bring in anywhere from a quarter to half a million dollars a year by selling drugs such as marijuana, cocaine and even prescription drugs. But raking in huge profits like that isn't easy for an unorganized operation, and the native syndicate is far from unorganized. Currently, it mimics a godfather style mafia structure. It has a boss, an underboss, a conciliary, and a lawyer for the gang. Most of the senior members are hardcore career criminals with a high tendency for violence. Members are recognizable by tattoos. The most prominent ones are a distinctive NS between the index finger and the thumb, two feathers, or a tomahawk and spears. Canadian authorities have long maintained that the native syndicate is a very organized gang in prison centers, but not so much on the streets. But that's just not true. The list of the gang's enemies is long, 
including Indian Posse, Manitoba Warriors, The Most Organized Brothers, The White Boy Posse, Loyalty, Honor, Silence, and Red Alert. Some of the native syndicate's connections include the Hells Angels, African Mafia, and the Zigzag Group. Members are mainly identified by the color black, with Northern Manitoba associates wearing the colors of the Raiders, whereas associates in Winnipeg wear a white bandana. The syndicate has approximately 200 members of almost all ages, including 10 to 20 females, and most of them are of Aboriginal descent. In the city of Regina, many smaller gangs have come and gone over the years, but the native syndicate still stands tall and holds a lot of power, and it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and want to see more like this in the future. Also comment down below letting me know what you'd like to see next. Thanks for watching and have a good one.